Hi, my name is Kai Ganser. Um, the last 10 years I was uh, concerned about the neural code and, and uh, decoding and investigating the neural code. Um, I did recordings from uh, RAD, Visual Cortex, and um, today I will talk about uh, ways to analyze the data that I got and ways to decode uh, the information that's in there uh, with Mathematica. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. Most interesting application possible is about uh, cracking the neural code. And uh, why is it interesting at all? Well, um, although it might be obvious, uh, let me scale this up a bit. Um, let me start with a quote from um, good old Donald Hepp, a Canadian psychologist, um, who said in, back in 1949, modern psychology takes completely for granted that behavior and neural function are perfectly correlated, that one is completely caused by the other. There is no separate soul or life force to stick a finger into the brain now and then and make neural cells do what they would not otherwise. One cannot logically be a determinist in physics and chemistry and biology and a mystic in psychology. If one is to be consistent, there's no room here for a mysterious agent that is defined as not physical and yet has physical effects. Mind can only be regarded for scientific purposes as the activity of the brain. And this should be mystery enough for anyone. So, um, it's clear that um, both behavior, mind, cognition, um, and neural activity in the brain is far from being random. Uh, so there must be some relationship between the two, um, which we could call a code. So in, in principle, a code can be defined in general um, by relation between two sets of symbols, um, which is the code input set um, that is related through a code relation function to a code word set. The input set is all the all the symbols that the code relation function accepts as an input, and the code word set is all the, is all the symbols that, that uh, the code relation function can generate. Um, applied to neurocognitive code, um, this would be the neuronal symbols that bring about, in whatever way, cognitive functions. And the neural code would be neuronal symbols that somehow translate into other neuronal symbols. So on, on the level of, of brain activity. And this is what we are after and what we are looking for. And if we find these symbols, um, we can somehow maybe relate them to cognition and, and um, say something about how the brain works. Um, now, this is essentially a data mining uh, task because you can record brain activity, but um, in the very beginning, you don't know what you're looking for. Um, so you have to define what neuronal symbols could be. And on the level of a single neuron, um, it's pretty clear what this would be. So a neuron looks like this. Uh, it has a soma here and uh, dendrites uh, with many synapses that get inputs from other cells and an axon um, that sends the output uh, signal of the cell, if there is one, uh, to other cells. And what you see here um, is the membrane potential uh, of, a, of an example cell over time. And these so-called spikes here, these action potentials, are very brief pulses um, of uh, less than a millisecond uh, duration. Um, and these are, so to say, the, the digital result of an analog computation done by the cell. The, the cell combines all the input signals it gets, and uh, every now and then, if it thinks it's, it's necessary, <laughs> so to say, it sends out this, this um, big uh, action potential pulse uh, down its exon to, to the recipient cells. And if you record extracellularity as depicted here with this electrode, you will see these uh, small extracellular, very brief pulses appearing. Um, so on the level of a single cell, this, this is clearly a neuronal symbol. Um, but this is this, uh, yes or no, it's, it's a binary signal. But of course, the, the whole thing is much more complicated if you go to populations of cells. Um, you have, at every instant of time, you have a number of cells firing. Um, and this might depend on, on many factors. So for example, different stimuli that you have here, let's, let's think of these, um, this, this population of cells as some cells in some uh, sensory area in the brain and uh, different stimuli elicit activity in, in different uh, cell populations that might overlap. Of course, if you go to the higher levels, you can also think of a stimuli as being internally generated by some other cell populations and you have these sequences of coactive cells. Um, so this is, Theoretically, um, the level on which we have to look for uh, uh, neuronal symbols uh, uh, and, and neuronal codes. So the, the questions would be, um, how independent are these cells? So are they completely independent? Do they somehow rely on each other? And it's, it's clear from an um, information theoretical standpoint um, 
that there must be some redundancy, that there must be some, some relation between the cells. They cannot be completely independent. But if they would be completely dependent, again, um, this would also be bad for, for information transmission. So there must be something in between. Then, of course, the spatial organization of these, these coactive cell assemblies and the timescales on which they, the timescales that matter. And it's also clear in theory that um, the, the smaller the timescale, so the faster the symbols appear and, and are computed, the better it would be for the performance of, of the brain and uh, animals or humans. So this is the task, the data mining task that I was after. And it very roughly translates into this uh, sketch. So you have here a number of parallel um, recordings, uh, so-called spike trains. So you have here these, these uh, timing of the events that you record. It in principle, could be anything. So you can now even start to think of other data that might look like this. In this case, it's neuronal signals. And what we need to do is to define a time scale called W here, um, some, some window of interest um, where we think um, the neuronal symbols are in. So they are not, they're not much smaller, maybe they are not much bigger. So some window depicted as W. And some timing precision of these events inside the window um, depicted as tau. That's the basic concept. And across the population, of course, as I said. Um, so what would we need to do? So we have some original data. And we look for, in a time-resolved uh, systematic uh, manner, look for repeating spatial temporal patterns on arbitrary timescales. So this is the, the variable that is, that is in, the, in the analysis. And detect repeating patterns first in the, in the original data. Um, now. The patterns that we find, um, no one knows um, in the beginning if they, are, if they appear randomly or not. So if, if there's any meaning in these patterns that do repeat. So we need some, some baseline for this, some statistical model. And the problem is that the, the single spike train um, or the, the intervals between events in a single spike train um, do not have any um, distribution that would be known. So you can approximate this with a gamma distribution, for example, but it's not precisely a gamma distribution. So there's no analytical way to solve this. So what we need to do is to construct surrogate data from the original data by destroying only this feature in the, in the surrogate data that we want to test for. And there are different ways to do this. For example, here in A, one could jitter the timing of every single event independently. But in this way, you destroy the outer structure of each train, and it's unclear what this does to the, to the statistics. So this is maybe not a good idea, although it's used a lot. Um, a bit more conservative way would be to um, simply keep the intervals in one train as they are, and to shift the, whole, the, whole, the timing of the whole train a little bit against each other. So you destroy the cross structure of the train, uh, but keep the outer structure. This is a, a viable way to do it. And going even a bit further, I developed a variant of this uh, by also swapping um, intervals that are small enough below some time scale um, uh, in these trains to make them even more um, distinct from each other. Then we, we repeat the whole analysis on, on each of these surrogate data sets. Um, and then we count the occurrences of every individual pattern that we found in the original data and in the surrogate data sets and compare them on an individual level to the counts of that pattern in the other data sets. And do a very simple um, um, non parametric uh, statistical test on it, maybe, maybe a binomial test or, or whatever you like. It doesn't matter on, on, on that level. Um, and discard all the patterns that are not significant in a statistical way on the individual level, and then do the same thing on a second level uh, and count the overall occurrences of the patterns that are statistically significant um, between, and, and, and compare this number between the original data and the surrogate data. And this is a, a very important second level test, and if the data passes this test, then we know that there is some structure on the original data as compared to the surrogate data that is non uh, random, and then we can have a, a, a closer look at the results. So this is maybe the most important um, slide of the talk. Um, this is how, how it's done. Um, these are real data, as an example, and we have here time scale W, time scale tau, and we, we, with a sliding window, um, we go through all the data and collect all the patterns that are in there and represent them with a with a vector. The, 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 the most the easiest way to do it is to um, let tau equal w and only have the rank of the events 
in the vector. In this case, it's unit number three fired first, then unit number two, then unit number four, and you have this vector three, two, four. This would be the pattern. Now, we run into a severe problem. Can anyone imagine what the problem might be on this step? Well, there might be larger patterns consisting of, let's say, 20 events, and there's a, a there is actually a sub-pattern of it, maybe consisting of five events that is significant and that does repeat. We, we wouldn't see it if we keep it as a, as a larger pattern and process this larger pattern. So we would need to somehow separate uh, the events in this larger pattern and make smaller ones of them, but now, now we run into a combinatorial explosion. So if we have 20 events, we can combine them in more than a million ways. This means that out of one pattern we make a million ones, and we need to test each of them. Uh, and, and this is simply, you cannot handle it. So um, it takes too much time and, and uh, too much memory in the computer to do it. So um, I came up with a little trick. It's a little bit cheating, but I introduced another time scale called T and computed um, cross correlations of the, of, of the single units um, uh, per time period T. And, and then I um, separated uh, uh, the, the patterns according to that, to that threshold matrix here. And for example, from this first uh, vector here, three, one, two, four, we get rid of unit number one because it doesn't belong to the others, and then we, we end up with three, two, four again. So this helps a lot, and I, I show you afterwards, this actually has a positive effect on the, on the result. Um, <clears throat> this is how the simulated data look like that are used for, for validating the method. Um, I will show you later a, a quick demonstration of this. Um, the, the data are simulated according to uh, 30 units and 50 seconds uh, uh, time with uh, on average like a few hundred events per unit uh, with repeating patterns like these. So we have uh, six different patterns consisting of uh, five units um, that occur within five millisecond windows. These are the details, they, they don't matter, so it's uh, I simulated them, which is conveniently done in Mathematica with uh, gamma processes with uh, certain parameters. Um, and these are results of the testing the method with the simulated data. So you see here that on the second level statistics, um, the false positive rate is below 5% uh, as it should be. Um, so here on the right row, we have this shuffling method um, as I showed you before, in, in, in C, if you remember, the, the surrogate data generating method is called shuffling intervals, and uh, it's slightly better than the others if you compare. So we have here the false positive rate, here the detection rate. Um, because the patterns are masked mostly by events that occur within the same time window, there are, of course, there are remain some remaining difficulties in detecting them. So um, the detection rate is not 100%, but it, it might be good enough, and it's slightly better here uh, on the right row. Uh, and this is the test power uh, um, for different parameter combinations. And you see that you get close to 80% if the pattern excess in the original data is about between 15 and 20%. So it's a conservative test. Um, test power is not brilliant, but I think good enough. And the important bit is that uh, the false positives are low enough. So it, it can be applied. And I did this to, to the recording, so this is um, the recording setup that I built in previous years in, at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research here in Frankfurt. Um, very briefly, so I recorded from uh, brain slices from red visual cortex with this uh, so-called Utah probe. Um, as these are silicon needles, uh, electrodes essentially, um, uh, with platinated tips um, with an electrode distance of 400 microns, and you can stick them into, into the tissue and, and record the activity of uh, many single cells. And this is how the data looks like. So this is how a spike actually looks like. So these are two milliseconds, and uh, on each channel you record actually more than one cell. So with a, with a method called spike sorting, you can separate these, these uh, cases, if you wish, um, of events, and then you get this sort of data. So any sort of data that looks like this, so you have parallel trains, time series uh, of events, any data that looks like this can be uh, analyzed by this method. And now the analysis goes like having a sliding window of, of uh, a duration W, um, sliding them over the data, collecting the patterns, separating them according to the, the cross correlations on time scale T, and compare them to the surrogate data. See what, let's see what we get. Sorry? What's the color coding of this? The color code is just, um, it, 
if it's red, it means that the resolution is too bad that you can see all the black ones. So it's many, many, you mean here. <clears throat> These are the results. So if um, I used 10 different uh, time windows, W, from 5 to 50 milliseconds, and this is the data mining thing. So I, I didn't know what time scale might be important, so I, I used different ones. And here is a very rough analysis of uh, the excess of coincident uh, spikes in this time window. And you already see that um, when you compare the original data with the surrogate data, that within time windows of 5 milliseconds, and uh, still in 10 milliseconds, um, you get much more events concentrated in these time windows in the original data. Remember that the original data only differ in the timing of the events, so the number of events is, is the same in the surrogate data. This is the first indication that there's something going on on these short time scales. Uh, here, this is the number of individual patterns that are uh, significant on the individual level, um, comparing original data and surrogate data, and you see that uh, it is significant up to about 30 milliseconds and then not anymore. And here is an, is an example of that. So if you have a time window of five milliseconds, this is the distribution that you get um, of, of counts of, uh, of significant patterns in the surrogate data and the arrow depicts the original result. If you go to 35 milliseconds in the same data, you see that um, you get essentially a, a random uh, result with this time window. So. Um, this was an indication that um, the, the, the symbols that we're looking for uh, do not appear on larger timescales than maybe 10 milliseconds or so. And having a closer look at the patterns that are significant, um, now please first concentrate on the left side. Um, we have again 10 graphs showing the results for 5, 10, 15, and so on, up to 50 millisecond windows. And what you see is the distribution of pattern durations. And in gray, you see the chance level. This is, this is the result from the surrogate data. And you clearly see that there's a prominent peak between one and two milliseconds, going uh, roughly to five millisecond uh, duration, where the original data clearly shows a feature and, and, and um, show a feature and deviate from the surrogate data. And that's, that's the main result. So the point is, I didn't put this into the, there's no assumption in the analysis saying that, well, we are looking for coincident events in let's say 10 milliseconds. No, no, if we have a time window of 50 milliseconds, you get this distribution, allowing for much longer events, but you get this prominent peak. If there would be no characteristic scale um, of these patterns, then the distribution would be entirely flat. It's not. There's, there's a peak between uh, one and two milliseconds, and this uh, graph B here shows this uh, zoomed in. We have two conditions here, by the way, um, spontaneous activity and activity that was electrically stimulated. It's essentially the same. So there is something going on in the first five milliseconds. Um, second thing is, if you, if you look at the temporal precision of these events, um, you, you can analyze this by, by having some average timing. So you have a, a pattern that repeats 10 times. And <clears throat> you uh, compute the average timing of the events um, uh, in this pattern and compare this to the individual timings of these 10 repeats. Then you again get a distribution that is um, extremely precise. And, interestingly enough, follows a power law, as you can see in C. Um, I'll come back to that later. So, the conclusions. Um, this is, of course, all speculation, but at least we, we have something in our hands now. Um, the, the transient synchronization of a selective group of cells may correspond to a meaningful transition from one cognitive state to another, while previously separate aspects of some seemingly meaningful information combine to give way to a holistic experience, like perceiving an object, reaching a decision, or becoming aware of some thought or idea. Um, this would apply to, or, or this yeah, would agree with the principle of structural coherence from David Chalmers, uh, a philosopher. Um, and this, is, of course, can only be speculation, but at least there's something in. So we did a data mining task on the data, and, and we found some, yeah, what we could call symbols that repeat. So there must be some, some meaning to them, and we can think about what it might be. <clears throat> Uh, another interesting aspect um, is this power law that I was talking about. Um, so the obtained distribution of spike time jitter seems to follow a power law, which has been regarded as a signature of self-organized criticality. 
And now it's of course tempting to suppose that under the given conditions, cortical networks self-organize into a critical state in which the noise affecting the timing of action potentials is tuned to a critical point. This is again only speculation, but it, it, it looks promising. Whether this explanation holds by what mechanisms such a point might be reached and whether spike time jitter in vivo, this was done in, in, in vitro from, from uh, brain slices, also follows a power remains to be investigated, of course. And I, I'd like really to stress this point and to point this out, that this pattern detection method can, of course, be applied uh, to any other data, like, for example, fMRI data, just by adapting the parameters and the temporal scales. So it's, it's open to any sort of, of data. And if time permits, I hope so, um, here's a quick demonstration of, so this is essentially the notebook that I used, and you can also uh, download it and use it. Um, I just want to, um, oh, let me change that. so that I can handle it. Initialize the notebook, give the parameters. This is, the, this is now a demonstration of the simulated data that I was talking about. It's, it's 50 uh, second data set consisting of 30 units with uh, about uh, 7,500 events in, in them. Uh, and what would you guess, how long would it take to, um, to do the sliding window analysis on the data? Hmm. Long? Done. Now, this was the original data. Now we construct the surrogate data. I told the notebook to do 20 surrogate data sets. The average spike displacement in time was 7.03 milliseconds. Let me see. OK. And now we do the same thing in each of these 20 surrogate data sets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Done. Now we do the testing on, of each individual pattern and the second level statistical test. Get a graph out of it. Let's have a look. Hope you can see it. Yeah. So in, in, in light gray is the surrogate data, and dark gray the original data, and you can, of course, clearly see, as expected, because I put them in, there are um, non-random uh, patterns in the original data. Here's a statistical test saying that it's, of course, significant. And then we save the results as text files. Come on. And um, you could have a look at it. It's simply text files, and you see that the patterns that should be in there, like, for example, this unit 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, in time bands 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, is there and has been detected. So this is how it works. And I just want to give you a brief outlook um, um, how we could improve this. Uh, of course, um, very easy to do, and I actually did this already. Um, one could parallelize the time-consuming steps in the computation with uh, the, the parallel commands, like parallel map, parallel table, parallel do. Um, this is uh, very conveniently done in Mathematica. Uh, it was no problem at all. When I tried this at first, it immediately worked. Um, and of course, to make the performance of the whole testing better, one one should do at some point an exhaustive search for all genuine higher order correlations in the data using a combination of methods and I started uh, doing this. First idea would be to search for all repeating patterns with another method, the two tapes method that was published in 1988 by Ables and Gerstein, and then test for higher order correlations um, between events using only these uh, found patterns that actually do repeat. Otherwise, um, we have this combinatorial explosion problem and this alleviates this a bit. Uh, still, we would have a memory problem, so I, I tried this, and um, with the same data that we're using, like two gigabytes of memory during the computation um, before with the method that I showed you, if, if you go to this um, exhaustive uh, testing, um, you immediately need like 100 gigabytes of memory, and, and this notebook cannot handle it. Um, but you, one could do a trick and use some, some bitwise representation and computation of patterns. Um, as you probably know, um, Typically, a number is represented in Mathematica with uh, using 64-bit of things. Uh, 
uh, um, yeah, it's represented with 64 bits, and if you, if you could do go down to one bit, you need, of course, much less memory. Um, and this can be done. If you use the two tapes method, um, you essentially have, uh, it's, it's called like uh, two tapes because you have um, uh, the data as a, you think of a, a sheet of paper with holes in it. Um, the holes represent kind of the spatial temporal pattern that are, um, um, that are there, so you have uh, time on the x-axis and then you have some events. And if you have two copies of these, of these papers and slide them against each other, at some uh, offsets you will have some uh, overlapping holes. And these are actually the repeating patterns that you have in the data. And uh, it's enough uh, for this method to have them represented as, as uh, single bits. Um, so this uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on actually currently. And of course, it would be very interesting to apply this method to other research areas, like, for example, genomic data, financial data, or any other big data. Um, for example, schizophrenia um, is a, is a gene-related disease. And there are like, you now like a few hundred candidate genes that, that people think are related to um, the appearance of schizophrenia in, in early adulthood. Um, the one gene that, that was found that um, can explain most of the or that has the, the biggest explanatory power for explaining um, the onset of schizophrenia um, can explain 6% of the cases. So um, this is not really the way one could go. Um, so one would need to find these higher order correlations beyond pairwise, so not like taking two, but taking more at the same time and having a much bigger explanatory power, hopefully, in this way. But this means finding these higher order correlations. Uh, yeah, and this I would really be interested in to do in the future. So. Thanks for listening. Um, the algorithms are uh, published in this paper. You can download it. Um, you can also the, download the, the notebook there.